are not your sweet babies, okay? Until you do until you do right by your first son, Monique, during Black Women's, Black History, Black Women's Month, we are not your sweet babies, okay? We are not your sweet babies. All these diamonds on my body and they crystal clear. I make magic with these hundreds, watch them disappear. Uh-huh. Big ol' raindrops up in my ear. If you gon' name drop, let's get it clear. Just say, ooh, VVS. I just turn the water on. Big ol' flex. Shit you never saw before. Uh, these niggas chasing me like waterfalls. What's up, guys? Now, before we continue this video, I wanna tell you guys about my favorite banking app, Dave. Now, y'all know I had seven teeth removed <laughs> last month. Now, right before my surgery, I actually ended up closing my account and transferring all of my money to another bank. However, it took a while for me to be able to access that money. Dave was able to come to my rescue so that I would have the funds to pay my copay for my surgery. You see, Dave is the banking app that levels the financial playing field. When you download the app, almost immediately within the first five minutes, you can get up to $500. No credit check, no late fees. As part of Dave's extra cash account, you can advance the money that you need with no interest and you can be able to settle it later on. So if you need extra money for gas, groceries, you know, a utility bill, or like me, if you need a copay so that you get seven teeth pulled out, <laughs> Dave is the baking app for you. Download Dave today at dave.com forward slash Jesse Wu. That is dave.com forward slash Jesse Wu. And you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less. Again, no credit check, no interest, no late fees. What you waiting on? Download the app right now. <laughs> uh, right, I said uh, right now. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com forward slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve. Dave is a member of the FDIC. What's up guys, it's your sis. Welcome back to my Chanel. Uh, if you are new here, I'm Jessie Wu, your sister. Make sure that you subscribe. Uh, if you are new or a returning sister, make sure that you like, that you share, and that you leave a comment. Child, we got a lot of things to discuss in this Just A Couple Things episode. But first things first, how was y'all Valentine's? Y'all had a Valentine's? Because I didn't. Like, not me not having a Valentine's. During Black Women's, Black History, Black Women's Month. Uh-uh, absolutely not. I ain't get no flowers, no candy. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't no testicles gyrating up in me or nothing, boy. Like, it's just crazy because, like, look at how fine I am. And I and, and, and you mean and you mean to tell me. You mean to tell me. <laughs> am I ashy? Sometimes I be ashy in the back. Maybe that's why I had all the times. Um... I ain't had no Valentine's child, but shout out to y'all who did have Valentine's. Y'all was hunching last night. Y'all hunch. Must be nice, child. The children are hunching. Everybody hunching. Uh, everybody hunching except Auntie Jessie. Auntie Jessie ain't get shit. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, y'all, let's go ahead and get to this episode of Just a Couple Things. Oh, before I continue, y'all, um, if you have not heard Do for Do yet. Please make sure that you go ahead and you download it, that you support it. Um, I have a new song called Do For Do. It is featuring Skills, a huge artist out of Nigeria. I'm actually gonna work on that lyric video because you guys did say that you want, want that. Um, I'm also working on the Waterfall song. Yes, yes, yes. It's so funny because I did not expect you guys to like Waterfalls, literally. It's, just, it's a song that I've had for like four years that I thought, would come across as me being corny so that I never released it. But to see y'all going up for it is crazy. Um, so shout out to y'all, but I also see the love that you guys are giving me for Do For Do. So make sure that you cop the song, that you download it, and keep an eye out for the lyric video. I'll let you guys know when that drops. All right, y'all, so, um, okay, let's start this video off with some good news. Portia Williams, Gwabadia announced that she indeed is coming back to Real Housewives of Atlanta. I'm really, really excited. Um, I, just a couple things. I'm really excited because I feel like she's gonna bring fun. She's gonna bring 
an energy that is missed. If you watched her on the Peacock Girls Trip, uh, her season of the Peacock Girls Trip where she went with Candace and um, just a bunch of other white women from other uh, Real Housewives franchises, she was so much fun. Um, she was definitely missed. Like it did remind me of, damn, like, I really do miss seeing Portia uh, on Atlanta, uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta Housewives, um, the franchise. So I'm really, really happy to see Portia, Portia Williams, <laughs> Portia Williams. And she made sure to say, uh-uh, now I don't know if Portia Williams is returning to Real Housewives of Atlanta, but Portia Williams Guabadia will be returning. And I love that, I love that. Who said that? Portia Williams coming back to Real Housewives of Atlanta? That's false. But Portia Gravadia is in the building. <laughs> See y'all. Um, can Portia Williams save Real Housewives of Atlanta? I think she can. As long as they don't lean into the Kenya versus Portia bullshit, we're over it. It's tired. We don't want to see it. And something tells me that if they do try that, that Porsche is going to pay it dust. So don't even try it. We don't want to see it. Um, I see that they have been talking about bringing uh, Phaedra back. Phaedra did somewhere say that um, coming, to, coming back to Real Housewives of Atlanta has been a discussion that she has had. Um, she didn't confirm that Andy told her um, or who told her, but obviously someone Talk, had the conversation with her and I do think that they've wanted her back for years. I think with Candy being gone It would be safer for her to come back. I know Candy and her like that was just never gonna happen Candy was never gonna film with Porsche uh, Candy was never gonna film with Phaedra and I don't blame her for that You know, we do have to remember the accusations that were made. They were accusations that could have been very very harmful to Candy's career um, and and they were lies um, and so, yeah, like I, I stand with Candy on that. Do I feel that Phaedra, Kenya, and Portia could revive Real Housewives of Atlanta? I don't know. Here's why I don't know. Have y'all been seeing Phaedra on Married to Medicine? She sucks on there. Like she, she's not doing any work. She's not doing any work. She, she supposedly had a doctor boyfriend and we never saw him. All we saw was a man with an emoji on his face. So she never gave us a storyline. Um, she's just popping in and popping out and, you know, giving us a couple, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, ooh, ooh, you know, like a couple moments here and there, but it's not giving anything. If she's bringing that to Real Housewives of Atlanta, we don't want to see it. Um, now if you're going to come to Real Housewives of Atlanta, you need to come correct. We need to know what's going on with Apollo, period. The fans do want to see that. They are going to want to see that. Or you need to bring your man. We don't want to see you bring no emoji niggas to Real Housewives of Atlanta. We want to know what's really happening. We know you ain't got no man for real. So what's going on with Apollo? And something tells me that Phaedra is going to try to tootsie roll around that. And if she's going to try to tootsie roll and shuck and jive around that shit, we don't want to see it. We don't want to see it. Uh, Bring Quad in there. Throw Quad in there. Put somebody else in there that's going to go to work. Put somebody in there that's going to go to work, okay? Um, so there's that. Those are my opinions. Let me know your thoughts on what do you guys think about Portia coming back. Uh, I've seen a lot of people say, damn, you know, Portia, don't let it ruin your marriage. I don't think she's going to let this ruin her marriage. Simon is very okay with being on television, but I think Simon has clear boundaries. Remember Portia had that one season of her show that she did with her family? I think she learned her lesson from that, and there are a lot of things we are never going to see, period. I think Portia is somebody that learns quick. She's learned. Like, this is not Portia Williams. This is not Portia Williams. It is Portia Wabaya. Okay? And I think she's learned a lot of lessons and she's not going, you're not going to catch her slipping this go round. Now, this is crazy. The first story that we have in this episode of Just a Couple Things is insane because, like, during Black Women's, Black History, Black Women's Month, you have a black teacher by the name of Neki Diallo um, getting fired from her job because they found her uh, only fan. Hold on. Jesse. Wait, wait a minute, y'all. My producer talking to me. Jesse. What? Um, 
that's not what that's oh she ain't black uh-uh not rachel don't let's doing this bullshit again girl you take your white ass on why are you still terrorizing black people why are you terrorizing black people to this day especially during black women's black history black women's month girl take your white ass on we are not we do not want to be bothered this month. We're not I told y'all white people we want a peaceful black ass month. And y'all have been committed to the disruption of black people during Black History Black Women's Month. What is that? Take your white ass on, please. Oh my God. What is wrong with this lady? She has like a black women's disturbance uh, fetish. What is going on? It's like, what is wrong with this? It's like she gets wet just like disrupting black people. Leave us alone. Leave us be, girl, damn. Shit, we got other shit to worry about. Here come your white ass with this bullshit. Come on now. People Magazine is saying this. We only learned of Miss Nechi Diallo's OnlyFans social media post yesterday afternoon. Julie Bar Julie Fairbarrick, a spokesperson for the California Foothills Unified School District number 16, said in a statement to People Wednesday, um, her posts are contrary to our district's use of social media by district employees. Uh, policy and our staff ethics policy. She is no longer employed by Catalina Foothills School District. Now, here's my thing. Now, if she was a black women's, you know, I'll be getting my we shall overcome on, okay? But Rachel, you know good damn well you are not a black woman. And not you impersonating the African. What is, what is his name? Is that Nigerian? Somebody help me out. Is this is it a name? Let me know in the comments. Not you impersonating a black women's during black women's black history month. You are white, okay? Everybody white, sit tight. You will not be standing up for the rights of white people this month. You got fired, you got fired, that's it. If your ass got fired, join the chitlin line, bitch. We don't give a fuck. You are white. Everybody white, sit tight. We not fighting for y'all right to stay alive this month. Listen, white people losing their jobs this month, we have nothing for you. We will not be protesting in your honor. We will not be hashtagging in your honor. We will not be down to the picket lines. We will not be standing up for your rights. You are white. You should have taken advantage of your white ancestry, okay? If you are losing your white jobs while being white during Black Women's Black History Month, if you are white, sit tight. We do not care. By the way, these are her OnlyFans pictures. This lady is diabolical. <laughs> this lady has an African women's fetish. I've, I've never seen this. Am I, you know who Rachel Dozel would make a great, great girlfriend to? Y'all know good damn well where I'm going with this. She would make a great girlfriend for Jonathan Majors. Bitch, this, this is the Coretta Scott King energy that he been looking for. Think about it. This is the Coretta Scott King energy that that motherfucker been searching all night long for, okay? He's been searching a long, a long time for Coretta Scott King energy. This is it. Somebody need to merge him. Somebody need to make them content as me. Somebody, Rachel, Jonathan, make them content as me, baby. Somebody left a comment under my post the other day, and they said, if you say Coretta three times, Jonathan Majors will appear. <laughs> I just hope, like, I never meet Jonathan Majors, because I know he's going to beat my ass. <laughs> for my ass because I have not let his ass rest. Um, but Rachel, take your white ass on, okay? This is not your month. If you are white, sit tight. Let's move on. Okay, so I'm a little late on this, but did y'all see this whole Jennifer Lopez and uh, Ayo Edebili uh, debacle that happened? So make a long story short, they recently had to host SNL together and right before they hosted SNL, I think it was two weekends ago, a clip from... Um, a podcast that she was on back in 2020 called Scam Goddesses resurfaced, and this is what the clip said. 
Today, I was actually thinking about one of my favorite scams of all time um, because J Lo is hosting or is uh, performing at the Super Bowl halftime yes, she show. She is, which is a scam in itself. And her whole career is one long scam. Oh, the longest con. J Lo can't sing. And did you know that J Lo doesn't know that she can, can't sing? Well, that's the thing that is. <laughs> she did an interview and then she was like, she, I never knew that people didn't think I could sing. I thought I could sing. Like, she thought that she was on. She thinks she's on multiple tracks, but it's not her. I think she, like, or she thinks that she's still good, even though, like, she's not singing for most of these songs. Like, a lo- and a- I was reading up because I was just, I just, I was fascinated. I became fascinated for myself. And a lot of the, like, uh, like write ups of the song will be like J Lo didn't have time to make it to the studio. Like J Lo was busy. It's like doing what? <laughs> Not singing, obviously. Now was she lying? Was she lying? A black women's telling the truth during Black Women's Black History Month. I mean, is she, was she lying? She ain't said nothing wrong. Okay, we all know that J Lo is a Shanti stunt double. All right, we know the truth and we own the truth as black women. Your ass is the Ursula of the industry. We know that shit. You've been stealing black voices for the last 30 years. Okay, let's be for real. Let's be for real, okay? And and, and no shade. Jennifer Lopez has had a great career. She's a dancer. She's an actress. Um, She's a performer, right? But what did Ayo say? Ayo said, in a nutshell, you cannot sing. And she not lying about that. So apparently... They both hosted SNL together, and um, Variety recently did an interview with J-Lo, and here's what she said about Ayo. She came into my dressing room and apologized with tears in her eyes, saying how terrible it was that she had said those things. She felt really badly and loved my performance because we had just done my sound check, and she actually got to hear me perform. She was like, oh, I'm so fucking sorry. It was so awful of me. And scene. Now we know damn well Ayo is an Emmy winning actress. She was in there chucking and jiving. <laughs> okay, like never before. Okay, that was her acting. Great performance, Ayo. In my opinion, Ayo deserves an honorary Emmy for this bullshit that she just did. For just, it was nothing to apologize about. It was nothing to apologize about. She clearly was on this podcast. She was making light of a situation that so many people have talked about before. She's not the first person to say this. She's not going to be the last. And the fact that you are seemingly bragging about making a black woman cry during black women's, black history, black women's month. (laughs) Girl, that's not it. Let's continue. All right, y'all. Um, we have Tiffany Haddish, who recently was interviewed um, on a red carpet by E! News. And, you know, she was asked about Monique's recent statements about her. And here's what she said. Now, you know, shame the devil. folks been opening their mouths and stuff been flying and letting we just heard Monique and she was speaking on you. And she said, well, I don't do business like Monique do business. And I'm glad I don't have that husband of hers. But she don't know your husband. And when I saw that, it's like, Tiffany, if you had a husband like mine, you may not have two DUIs. So what is happening in the comedy space right now? Why are folks just going at it. I have no idea, but I am grateful and thankful that I am on the, the minds of people I look up to. That's so awesome. you look up to her. So was I it disappointing? To, I, I was yeah, going to say, was it disappointing hearing her talk no. about it? No, it felt like it felt like an auntie talking to me. You know how we do. You know how we do. So I was like, oh, dang, I've been on your mind. I didn't even know I was on your mind. So I'm grateful. She's kind of rewriting history here. You started it. Like... <laughs> You literally started it. This all stems from an interview that she did with GQ in GQ magazine. So at this point in the interview, right, they start talking about just the pay. She was talking about how she only got paid 795 bucks for an episode of That So Raven that she did uh, back in 2005, right? Uh, and she said, but the residual checks are certainly nice. I got one for two cents the other day. Uh, they could have just held that. So she was she was shedding light on what Monique was shedding light on at that time and what Monique has still been shedding light on, what Taraji, what Issa Rae, like what all of these black women are talking about, which is the pay 
and the the opportunities that are not really opportunitying for black women. Right. So they're, they're talking about that in the interview. And so um, when she brought up residuals, she brings up this is what the article says. She brings up residuals again, and when our conversation turns to Netflix, specifically Monique, Monique's call for boycott of the streaming service in light of what the comedian described as gender bias and color bias in the paychecks offered to various comics for their stand-up specials, a reported $20 million for Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock, a reported $11 million for Amy Schumer, and five hundred dollars for Monique, she says, right? So here is what Tiffany Haddish said about Monique discussing unequal pay. Here's what Tiffany said. My business run different than her business, says Haddish. I don't live her life. I don't have that husband of hers. I'm looking at how Netflix has opened up so many opportunities for black females in comedy. When, when my people are dying, that's when you're gonna catch me protesting. I'm not gonna protest because somebody got fired for, uh, I'm not going to protest because somebody got offered not the amount of money they wanted to get offered. If you don't like what they're offering you, just no longer do business with them. If I protest Netflix, what about all the black shows that's on there? What about all the other actors that are on there working? All the Indians, the Hispanics, the Asians, my show, the Carmichael show airs on there right now. It ain't on NBC. That's what she said, Right. She could have said all that without mentioning her husband. Because Tiffany had a point. Tiffany's point is a lot of people's point. Just because somebody, just because so-and-so mistreated you doesn't mean that that's, my, that's not my experience. Your experience is your experience. My experience is my experience. So just because you had a bad experience doesn't mean that I should not do business with this entity. I agree with that. I agree with it. You didn't have to mention that lady husband. You started that. And so she hit you back as she should. Her husband had nothing to do with that. Tiffany has a point and so does Monique. Both of them had points. Netflix is very much known to give a lot of people of, of color and black folks a lot of opportunity. I know a lot of people who work with Netflix and are successful that are black. There are a lot of black executives at Netflix. You know what I mean? Like Netflix is a hub where a lot of black people and people of color uh, tend to be very successful, more successful than there than I see other networks and other uh, streaming services. Um, so she had a point with that. I just feel like, you know, mentioning her husband had nothing to do with it. And then, you know, you kind of while she had a point, you just said you only got paid seven hundred dollars for an episode of that so raven and you only get two cents in residuals for that so monique's point is very very valid um but let's go ahead and move on to monique monique versus her son to me has me looking at monique differently and i hate that because i have always been a supporter of monique i think she is right when it comes to the Tyler Perry issue and the Oprah issue. I think that she is right. You know, when she did Precious, she got paid $50,000 at the time. This was before Lionsgate jumped in bed with Tyler Perry and Oprah and they came and they gave the, they um, put more gas and fire behind the film, giving it more distribution and allowing it to make multi, a multi-million dollar profit that she never saw anything from because her contract was with Lee Daniels. It was not with Lionsgate. It wasn't with Tyler Perry. It wasn't with Oprah. So I do feel that her walking away with 50,000 and her asking to be paid for um, promotion and engagement outside of what she agreed to with Lee Daniels and the result being her being blackballed, I think that that wasn't right either. I stand with her on that. I stand with her on that. I also think that, you know, Tyler Perry admitting, you know, behind closed doors that he was wrong and that he didn't have a difficult um, experience with Monique because he actually didn't work with Monique directly. I think him admitting that, um, taking ownership of that in private, but not taking ownership in public, I think that was wrong as well. I think 
Oprah interviewing her family members, you know, right after she won the Oscar against Monique's wishes, you know, getting that nasty story from her brother and her mom. Like, I think that was disgusting. I stand with her on that. I stand with her when she talks about the, the pay disparity when it comes to black women in Hollywood. She is right. She is right. But Monique, when it comes to your son, you are dead ass wrong. And what it shines a light on for me is how Monique has a tendency to be right about a situation, but go about it the wrong way. And that's what I want to talk about. I think Monique is an amazing person. I think she's hilarious. I think she's funny. She's had a great career, but she has always been clear. She's talked about her son several times. Club Shay Shay was not the first time that she talked about being a bad mother to her son. She's talked about not wanting to be a mother, not being interested in being a mother. She talked about sacrificing her relationship with her eldest because she wanted to be famous. She wanted fame. And you know what's crazy? I think how people are villainizing her for being a bad mom is so ironic because dads do this every fucking day. Like, I'm sorry. Like, can we be honest during Black Women's, Black History, Black Women's Month, especially in the Black community, dads get up and leave every day. Every day. They're not interested in being a part of their child's life every day. You know, I've talked about not growing up with my father. Side note, the internet always has this thing where they, when I, when I go viral for saying something about men, people always, oh, well, she grew up without a dad. I've never said... I grew up without a dad. I grew up without my father. My mother has been married for over 20 years. I don't talk about my stepfather like that because I have two siblings from, my mom has two siblings from that marriage. I'm the eldest of the first set, okay? I'm the eldest of four. Um, my mom has another set of two kids with that marriage. And so out of respect for those siblings, I don't talk about their, their dad. Um, but that's been a huge source of contention for me and my siblings, the way I felt and still feel about their father. I knew their father before they knew their father, but I'm not going to talk about their father because that's their father. He's not my daddy. He ain't never been my dad. He never will be my dad. I don't acknowledge him as my dad. I never called him my dad ever. Um, but he's been in my life since I was like eight years old. Okay. So th that should tell you enough about my relationship with that man. And that's what, that's all I will say. Um, but as someone who grew up without a father, and I know a lot of people who grew up without their fathers, fathers get up and leave all the time and they don't get dragged like this. It's not saying that they don't get dragged, but they don't get dragged like this. Like, Oh my God. Like men are almost expected to be absentee. There are a lot of you guys who grew up with your fathers, but your father was still absent. Sometimes a father can be in the home and still be absent. And if you're watching this right now, there's a large percentage of you that can relate to that. Having a father in the home, but he, he might as well have not been there, literally. Um, but I feel it's very sexist. It's misogyny to shine that type of light on her, especially since Monique has always said this. She's always said she was a horrible mother to her son nothing new and so when her son came out and he talked he didn't really share anything new he just shared his perspective and also he did share that you know because when she was on club shay shay she talked about you know i i apologize to my son it's up to him where he wants to go with this and his whole thing was no no no, no. it's not up to me you're the parent you're the parent you need to do the work and I can so, first of all, let me back up. I related to this man so much because I too am the eldest. He sounds like an eldest daughter. Eldest daughters, raise your hands. He sounds like an eldest daughter. I'm an eldest. I'm the eldest of four. And this dynamic between him and Monique, even though my mom was, my mom was never an absentee mother, but if I had to describe my relationship with my mother, I would say this. I am the eldest of four to a Haitian mother. That's all I got to say. Let me know when we start a support group. 
<laughs> okay? If you are the eldest daughter of a Haitian, Caribbean mother, African mother, Indian mother, and you have eldest daughter syndrome, come on down in the comments. Let me know what time I need to set up a Zoom because we need to have a support group. There needs to be a support group for eldest daughters, period. That's all I'm going to tell you about my relationship with my mama. I think that explains everything. Um, but he sounds like an eldest daughter. He sounds so hurt. And he acknowledged, he said, yeah, like how my mom has said, my mother was not there. My mother, I've had to watch my mother. Oh, there was a point where he said he had to watch his mother prefer the love of everybody else but his. That was so hurtful to hear. It was so hurtful to hear. And I think a lot of kids can relate to that, especially like kids with like uh, mothers or, or fathers who are public figures. Uh, if, if your parents are, are church leaders or politicians or like where, the, where they, they serve the public in some shape or form and entertainers, children are left feeling this way. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big conversation to have. But also he said something else and I want to play it back. He said this. Um, my mother does a fantastic job of acknowledging a lot of things, but she doesn't take accountability very well. And Baby, this is African parents, Haitian parents, <laughs> black parents. This is them. This is y'all in a nutshell. My mother does a very good job of acknowledging, but she doesn't take accountability very well. And he ate that. And what happened after he did this was Monique and daddy getting online and doing the exact thing he just said. Acknowledging, but not taking accountability. Oh, well, you talk about you didn't want to call Sydney daddy, but you, you did want to call Sydney daddy. We just let, we didn't let you call him daddy because he ain't your daddy and you have a real father. And let's talk about your mental state. Like they even like touch on his mental state, kind of letting us know that something is not right with him mentally and that shit was not okay with me. And then the whole, oh, when you need a car, we gave the money for the car. When you need a food for your baby, we gave you money for the food. As you fucking should. Mind you, this is daddy saying all this and you got Monique sitting next to daddy. You proved him correct. You acknowledged and took no accountability. What parent responds to their child online? And here's the thing. He is a grown ass man, right? But he had every right to address this because Monique has done several interviews throughout the years talking about her son. And then you have this Club Shay Shay interview that has garnered millions of views, millions of expression of impressions online. And so somebody who's been quiet for 30 years is finally like, you know what? Let me speak my piece because you're making this very rosy and it's not as rosy as you paint it. You have not tried to have a real relationship with me. You have not tried to reach out to me and build and build something with me. You've thrown money at me, yes, a couple times, but I'm your son. Where is my relationship with you? It's non-existent. And you got online and you did, you did exactly what he said that you do. And it had me thinking a lot about the Will Packer story and the Kevin Hart story. The Will Packer story for me, I don't know why, but I thought about it for a lot for, for a couple days. And I'll say why. I think I think one of the reasons why is because I've personally worked with Will Packer before. I did a show called Power Star Live with Will Packer. Will Packer was a joy to work with. And throughout the years, he's been a joy to talk to. He's been a joy to interview. Um, I have wanted to be in, in his productions. I haven't been lucky enough to be a part of it, of any of them. But He's always been a joy, very professional. Yes, he jokes, he kids, 
And I think when I go back and I listen to her story, I'm like, did you misread that? Did you take things a little too personal with that? Not, not discrediting what she said, but something about the Woolpacker story to me when I revisit it didn't sit well with me. We got a problem. What about the Parker? What about Moesha? Had anybody said anything prior about Monique's character? prior to prep her not wanting to do international press, what she wasn't contractually obligated to do. Never. Prior to that, nobody said anything. Never. The only person that could say anything as a, that is a producer is a guy named Will Packer. I did a movie called Almost Christmas. Mm -hmm. When Will Packer sat down with my husband and I, Shannon, every other word out of his mouth was queen. You are queen and the, the queen and the queen and the queen. And we just want you to do a cameo. And here's what we're going to pay you. My husband said, Will, that does not cover Monique doing promotions. That covers none of that, brother. Right. This is just for the cameo, right. okay? Yeah. The director was David Tauber. My husband and David Tauber were college roommates. They, they were across the hall from one another. Right. In the script, I was that quick because it's a cameo. Right. Okay? Yeah. So 99% of the things you heard Aunt May say, it was Monique. It was me ad Yeah. Okay? Because it's a cameo. Right. When we had a meeting with Will Packer, Will Packer says, if you do this for me, I'll give you a three-picture deal and a sitcom. Now, we have all of this in writing. It's all in writing. What were you, what were you, what were you, what were you needing to do? A press? You're going to need to do press for it? You're going to need to promote it? Or just, just, just do the cameo? Just do the cameo. That is what was agreed upon. We were going to do a cameo for the amount of money that he said they were going to pay. No problem. Well, what they did was they kept spreading it out. They kept spreading this character out. We want you in this scene, and that scene, and this scene. But there ain't no cameo. Cameo is a... Okay. Okay? David Talbot is our, friend, is our friend. We don't want to make this bad for David Talbot. So we said, okay, no problem. Now let's talk about the treatment. While we're on that set of Almost Christmas, there were a few things that was happening that I took issue with. Will Packer is a producer. He came on that set and tried to give us a direction while the director was standing right there. I said, Will Packer, I will not allow you to do that. You would never do that to Steven Spielberg. You would never do that to a white director. You as a producer going to just walk in and give a direction. So I will not take direction from you. If you have something you want to give to me, you give it to the director. And you have the director to give it to me. You are disrespectful to him. Now, I had a meeting in David Talbot's trailer with Will Packer, David Talbert, and the first AD because they were being disrespectful to this black man mm -hmm. and I was not going to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with the first AD and I pulled him outside. I said, listen, brother, when it's your turn, I won't let nobody do it to you. But what I'm not going to do is stand by and watch you give a direction after the director gives us a direction. It confuses the cast and it's disrespectful. And to that black man's credit, his eyes filled up with water and he said, I appreciate you for having this conversation with me. I have a problem with that. I really, I have a problem with that. Now, I'm glad that Monique said if there was one person that could call me uh, uh, difficult, it would be Will Packer. But the way she packages the story, she has this like, I'm everybody's hero syndrome. I don't know what that's called, but it's like, oftentimes when she tells a story, she tells you, the story from a standpoint of here's the wrong that was done and here's how I was a hero because if I don't stand up for this then this person doesn't get this and black people don't get that and black women don't get this and black men don't get that I have a problem with that I have a problem with that because it absolves you from the accountability it's like what her son said she acknowledges it but she doesn't take accountability. And I think that Monique has a problem with taking accountability for when she goes about the right thing the wrong way. Here is where I think she was wrong with Will Packer. Listen, Will Packer is a producer, right? David E. Talbert was a director, right? But this is still a Will Packer project. 
And like she goes on later on and she says, you know, he was saying he the head nigga in charge. And was. <laughs> he was the head nigga in charge. And so you don't talk to the head nigga in charge that way. The same way she said, she told Will Packer, no, 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 you ain't going to do that because you would never do that to Steven Spielberg. Well, you would never do that to a white producer. It goes hand in hand. And let's be very, very clear. Monique at that time, she had an agent, she had a manager, she had, an assist, she had a team. Why are you having a meeting with David and Will Packer? If at any point during the set, during your time on set, and this is just a, a piece of advice, if at any time you're having difficulty on set, you need to call your agent, you need to call your manager, you need to call your agency, and they need to handle that. Not you, not you. You're not the hero. Monique, you're not always the hero. You're not always Spider-Man. You're not always Batman. You have to know how to handle certain situations. In that situation, you were dead ass wrong. You were dead ass wrong. And to package it in a way where Will Packer is the villain, I think that is very irresponsible. You're right. The director should give direction, but you don't know what David and Will's relationship was. You don't know what conversations they had before they got on set with each other. And, you know, by all accounts, anybody who's worked with Will, Will is very hands on. Like, like it's like you going to work with your brother. So you don't know what conversations they had. And here you come with your ego and your ego is leading the conversation. You were dead ass wrong, dead ass wrong. Everything doesn't have to be addressed by you. That's something that I had to learn. It took me years to learn. And even now still, like sometimes in my content, I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna talk about this or I'm not gonna talk about this person. Or I'm not, you know, I'm not. Like I could touch on that, uh, I ain't. I could address this, but I ain't. There's a lot of things I just, moving forward, especially like this year and beyond, like I had a conversation with my prior agent in December and literally like he and I just, it was a brutal conversation, but I felt like after talking to him and letting a lot of things out, I told myself, you know what? I'm going to let this go. I'm, I don't have to fight for everything. I don't have to like, when I was on all the cart, there were a lot of things that were happening that I was like, well, this should be this and that should be that. And it's like, I don't have to do that. That's number one. Number two, you know what? Other people ain't going to do it for you. Who have you seen come out in defense of Monique? Has David E. Talbert come forward and said, yes, Monique stood up for me on the set? No. A lot of times people do this. They're, they want to be everybody's hero. And you know where that stems from? It is because nobody was your hero. And I had to really make peace with that before the year was over and, and coming into this year. And it still makes me a little emotional because I know what it's like to see bad things happen and to be like, but nobody else do it for you. And I had to make peace with the fact that they don't have to, they're not requ required to, and they're minding their business. Some people just, they just want to mind their business. And that's what I'm going to do going forward. I have nothing. I have nothing. 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 I have nothing. I have nothing. I don't need to be everybody's hero. I don't need to be the savior. That's a savior complex. And Monique needs to get rid of that so that she could really move forward. Your son called you out on that and he was dead ass right. He was right. Um, I think another issue too, like I said, is going about things the wrong way. I'll never forget, you know, doing a reality show and addressing certain things and being right and being completely right and being punished for it from behind the scenes and even the editing. Right. But as the years have gone by, everything I said about a certain person turned out to be right. Everything, everything. But the problem was I went about it the wrong way. Sometimes you can be right, but when you go about things the wrong way, 
when you open certain doors that you didn't have to open, you have to deal with those consequences. And had I just minded my business, I would have had a totally different experience. Life has a tendency of revealing people. And as, as time has gone by, that person has been revealed. But what did I get out of it? Nothing. I didn't have to address that. I didn't have to. It took me years to make peace with myself and to say, you were wrong for that. You were wrong. Yeah, you might have been right, but you were still dead ass wrong. You can be right and still be dead ass wrong. Monique was dead ass wrong for telling us that Kevin Hart story. And y'all might disagree, but she was dead ass wrong for telling us about Kevin Hart. And here's why I say that. Kevin Hart wrote you a check. Kevin Hart made the calls that he promised. He promised you he would call, he would call Tyler. He told you he ain't no Oprah, but he knew Tyler. He called Tyler. He went and gave you a check, right? Now, the communication between Kevin and his manager and all that, that was murky, right? And I think that Kevin Hart should have told you, you know what, Monique, they don't want to fuck with you. They ain't trying to fuck with you. I really believe Kevin really tried. But the people around him were like, hell no. And I think he should have had the guts to tell you that. I just don't think he wanted to give you that last blow. You didn't need to tell us that. Y'all gonna disagree with me. We didn't need to know that Kevin Hart story. We didn't need to know it. He gave you a check. He made the calls. He did what he could have. Yes, I think that broke Monique's heart, but for you now to go, oh, he's a gatekeeper and he's the, and just put it all on him? No. All those events that happened before Kevin got involved are the reason why those people didn't want to fuck with you. That's not Kevin's fault. That is outside of Kevin's control. So I think that Monique was dead ass wrong for telling us that. And then the way you're going about it with your son. You're dead ass wrong. Coming to the internet and showing us a series of text messages that literally prove his point. You're showing us text messages from 2021. It's 2024. And it looked like the communication with you and your son was okay until daddy got involved. So again, your son is correct. Only you're dead ass wrong. And instead of worrying about us sweet babies, you need to go make it right with your first sweet baby. For real, for real. For real, for real. For real, for real. You're doing to your son what you claim the industry has done to you. It's abusive. It's dismissive. You're not validating him. You're shading him. You are invalidating his experience. And you're being disgusting. God forbid. Like, let me tell you. I've told y'all in this video, I don't have the best relationship with my mother. But God forbid I call my mother right now and I tell her I'm down and out, that lady will be at my front door. She'll be at my front door. Front door. Okay? With my recent, um, with my recent surgery, I think the only reason why my mom didn't come is because now she has my grandmother with her in Miami and so it's hard for her to, to move around. But... I'll never forget a couple years, uh, what, two years ago when I had to go have surgery, you know, on my, um, on my cervix. I didn't tell her anything. I didn't tell my, my, my family anything. At the time, my aunt was de deteriorating from cancer. And here I go with cancer cells all over my damn, you know, cervix. Like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. And literally, it was two days before the surgery. And I called. I was like, hey. Um, I got the, she was at the front door. First thing smoking. First thing smoking. If I have a child right now, it's going to be her child. I know that. <laughs> I know that to, one thing I know to be true, no matter what me and my mother have been through, my mom would be at my front door for certain things. If I call her and she hears my voice, like she knows. That's one thing about my mom is I can call her and she will know, like she will know. And she will be at my front door. And 
this is just really triggering to see you treat that man like that. Especially given everything you've been through. How do you treat your own blood like that? With everything you stand for, how do you treat your own blood like that? Throwing it in his face that you had to send him money for your granddaughter, your grandchild, your blood. No, no ma'am, no ma'am, no ma'am, no ma'am, no ma'am. You are dead ass wrong. Um, and I hope that you go and you fix it with your real sweet baby and leave us alone. <laughs> we are not your sweet babies, okay? Until you do until you do right by your first son, Monique, during Black Women's, Black History, Black Women's Month, we are not your sweet babies, okay? We are not your sweet babies. Take your ass to your son's house and fix it right now. Um, all right, y'all. Let me go ahead and get to the scandal for today, child. It, it just, this made me very emotional. I could relate to a lot of these things, but then also, like, I'm going to tell y'all right now, my mama would be, my mama? And I don't have the best relationship with my mama. I don't. Again, I'm, I'm an eldest daughter. Eldest daughters unite. Y'all understand what I'm talking about. But my mother would be at my front door. Front door. Hello, Jessica, front door. Jessica, front door. And every morning she'd be up in this house. And she throwing her holy water, baby. She, what? Mama? No, ma'am. <laughs> I cannot relate. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I cannot relate to that. Your mom, like, just, no. No, ma'am. Nous célébrons louange. My mama would be praying this house down. Okay? If I call her crying about, I done lost my job, and I this and I that, and my, my grandbaby, her grandbaby sick. No, ma'am. My mama would be, my mama would be at the front door with her stethoscope. Okay? <laughs> Hell no. Nah. Ear to my baby's heart. Okay? No, ma'am. You need to go fix things with your son and leave us the fuck alone. Okay? Let's move on to uh, this video's social scandal. Well, this episode of Just a Couple Things, a social scandal comes from uh, Poor Minds. So Poor Minds is a podcast hosted by Dre Nicole, Lex P. Shout out to my bros. Um, they recently had, you know, a clip that went really, really viral. And here's the clip. So if you're making fifty thousand dollars, don't date. Ooh. I'm I'm just being for real. You're not ready to date. Again, I'm with you. When you're not you're ready right. to date. You're not ready to date because courtship costs. Okay. Everything costs. Okay. You can go for twenty two walks in the park. Eventually, Shorty is gonna need a sip of something. She's gonna she be thirsty. thirsty. This <laughs> bottle of water is three dollars in Atlanta. Let's oh, not play. Please. So if you don't have any expendable cash, don't date. And whatever that looks like for you, you might only make 50,000, but you live in a shoe. And now you got expendable cash. Or get you a bottom of the barrel bitch that's gonna date you when you have no money. If she doesn't have that expectation, and I'm gonna tell you this right now, enjoy it while it lasts, because eventually you're gonna wanna run. Because she doesn't stretch you, she doesn't make you the man that you need to become. She allows you to be the stagnant dude in the same jeans for days. You know what I'm saying? Be cutting up, I'm just talk about me. Do not let the ladies of the Poor Minds podcast deter y'all from fucking a nigga who makes less than $50,000 a year. I'm telling you, that's where the dick is at. That is where the dick is at, baby, okay? Plenty of dick. Plenty of dick.com. Niggas who make $50,000 or less, baby, they got that dick. They got that dick, and <laughs> I'm not gonna let Drea or Lex deter me from fucking a nigga that makes less than fifty k a year, baby. That's, that is that is Six flags, baby. It got all the rides. Unlimited rides. Okay? <laughs> Unlimited rides. But, um, yeah, I'm not going to disagree with her, but I will say if all you're looking for is, if that is, like, at the top, a man will make this a certain amount of money, girl, it's not happening right now. They ain't got it. These niggas ain't got it. Got it. Got it. These niggas ain't got it. Okay? These niggas ain't got it, got it, got it. You see that? 
You see that, Alicia off keys? That's how you sing off key. <laughs> These niggas ain't got it. So good luck to y'all. And the niggas that do, they prefer for you to know that they have it instead of them actually spending it on you. That's what I have found. Um, don't get me wrong, I have been with men with money. Um, and you know, I've gotten experiences. The last person that I dated seriously was a couple years ago. And but I think for me, that person was at a stage where they wanted to prove to themselves and other people that they like black women when they really didn't. Um, and as soon as he had the opportunity to go back to his non-black woman, he did. Uh, and so, you know, my experience was very limited, <laughs> but it wasn't because he really wanted to shower me with, every, you know, with gifts and whatever. It, he had other intentions. I'm someone who is not a preference. I'm not a preference. Um, you know, and please don't come in my comments telling me, oh, you, but you're pretty. I know I'm pretty. I, I'm, I, I know I'm gorgeous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you ain't got to tell me. I know I'm gorgeous, but I know I'm not a preference. And because I'm not a preference, I have had certain, certain dating experiences that these girls who sit up on these podcasts and they tell you how many, how men come in their lives and they buy them this, they buy them that, they buy them, th them this jewelry, they buy them this car, they take them here. I have not experienced that. I haven't just met a man and he took one look at me and, and started spending money on me. And I woke up to cash apps and all that. Maybe, maybe it's because I never asked. I don't know. But I've never experienced that. So to those of you guys who are experiencing it, congrats, congrats, congratulations. It should have been me. Okay. Unfortunately, that's not my story. That's not my testimony. But I'm happy for the girlies who do get it. Um, but yeah, in this economy, they ain't got it, y'all. My Valentine's from last year. Woke up the next day after Valentine's. And went to my fridge and drank up three of my coconut waters. He was thirsty. He needed to drink three of my coconut waters. And I was like, yes, so I'm going to need you to cash at me $16. What? 16 I was like, yeah, I need that $16 back, baby. You see this economy? I need that back. Oh, so I got to pay you? Yeah, bitch. That's coconut water, ho. The fuck? You open up my fridge and you wanna drink about my coconut water, you ain't bring me no flowers, you ain't bring me, no, like, it wasn't no shivery or nothing, and you think, and you think, you finna drink up all my coconut water? And I'm just giving this story because this man was crying about $16. Mind you, this nigga had red bottom sneakers at the front of my, at the front of my door. Red bottom sneakers, but was crying to me about $16. You know what I mean? Like, I sell them. And some of you are going to be like, oh, well, you need to pick better. You need to choose better. You need to, okay. Where? From where? These niggas ain't got it. Some of y'all are going to come in the comments, oh, but did you fuck him? I sure did. That man was broke. He obviously was broke. He was looking for a place to stay. Have y'all ever had sex with a man that's looking for a home? Ain't no dick like broke dick. It ain't no dick like a man with no headboard, okay? I sure did fuck that man. But he had to give me my $16, point blank period. You're not going to take me on a last minute Valentine's and then come and fuck my brains out and think you're gonna drink up all my coconut water. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay? But was it dick fire? It was. It was. And it was Haitian too. Oh, it was. <laughs> Baby, top tier Zozo. Okay? Top tier dingling. All right? Dingling was dingling. But yeah, you, I still need my $16. <laughs> Diamonds on my body and they crystal clear. I make magic with these hundreds, watch them disappear. Uh huh. Big ol' raindrops up in my ear. If you gon' name drop, let's get it clear. Just you, BB.